Thank you, Jack. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening to all professor and um, doctors. It's 4 p.m. now in Jakarta and 6 p.m. in uh, Kyoto. So thank you for attending uh, today's uh, meeting. So as you know, this is the seventh meeting since the uh, we begin the meeting on recording the, in progress March uh, last year. So it's one year uh, already uh, that we have this kind of meeting. So I do really uh, appreciate for all the um, contributors that joined the meeting up until now so um so i can believe that we can have uh, this uh, almost uh, i think one year already having this kind of meeting and we will have another more year in the next future so i think um just want to know that uh, how about the weather now i think the sakura already full bloom now here there at kyoto is it right yes yeah, so uh, i do miss the kyoto uh, sakura at the kamogawa <laughs> yeah um at, and in Jakarta now we have the Ramadan uh, Ramadan month, so that's why we start earlier uh, today because uh, we will have uh, uh, the late lunch after the sunset. So that's why we start earlier. So I uh, think um, so we for any without any further ado, I think we will start the first presentation that will be performed by. Uh, Dr. Koji Kitazawa, uh, he will present uh, about the ocular surface reconstruction management in SDS uh, temptation. Dr. Uh, Koji, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, clear. Well, uh, thank you for introduction, Yulia, and then also uh, thank you for great uh, giving me a great opportunity. So this is what we would like to talk about today. So first of all, I'd like to talk about the use of uh, limbal digital contact lens in management of severe ocular surface disease. And the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Kamada. Uh, she will talk about the low vision management for severe ocular surface disease. And the last that Dr. Sakamoto will give a case presentation. So this is the uh, uh, agenda of my from our side. So let me get started. So uh, we've been proposing the uh, cultivated oral mucosal epithelial transplantation, a uh, COMET, uh, since 2004. Uh, this is the process of the COMET surgery. So we take the oral mucosa uh, from the patient and then isolated the uh, oral mucosa epithelial cells into a single cells, and they see the cells onto the uh, the culture plate that is covered with the amniotic membrane. So we now don't use the feeder cells, so we only use the amniotic membrane to culture the cells. And then cells are cultured for two weeks to make the stratified uh, oral mucosa epithelial sheet. And then after that, we remove the abnormal or uh, the tissue uh, on the surface of the patient, and we transplanted uh, this comet seed onto the bare uh, cornea. Sometimes uh, we put the, this seed on the uh, conjunctival and the sutures. So this is uh, what we will usually do when we perform the comet surgery. So and then also the, we have recently announced that. The, uh, the new product for the treatment of the SJS uh, 10 patients was released by uh, the Hirosaki Life Science Innovation Company in Japan uh, uh, in collaboration with us. The, uh, the, this is the autologous human oral mucosal epithelial sheet using the amniotic membrane substrate. Now it's uh, commercially available and then it is covered by the health insurance in Japan. So uh, the, the name of this this product is uh, Sakura C. Sakura means the, uh, as uh, the urea knows well, the, uh, it uh, means the uh, uh, cherry blossom in Japanese. So we hope, we wish the patient who received the, uh, this product, Sakura C, will be able to see the vision nicely. 
So uh, the, this is the representative case that's received the comet surgery. The, uh, this is 20 years male SCS patient. So as you can see, the pre uh, cornea showed preoperative cornea showed the uh, severe uh, cornea scarring, the neovascularization and the keratinization, uh, and then also the severe zimbrifarum. And then visual acuity was 0 0.004. And then also we evaluated the severity of the, uh, uh, this patient according to the uh, grading score, uh, which was proposed by the Professor Sotozono uh, in ophthalmology back in 2007. And then his uh, grading score was 19 at the preoperatively. Uh, but the six months after the comet surgery, the visual acuity uh, improved uh, up to 0.2. Uh, 0 0.2 from the 0 0.004, uh, which was great. And then also the grading score was greatly uh, decreased uh, at up to the 4.0. And then until three years, the, uh, the ocular surface uh, was uh, stable. So however, uh, we see uh, some cases with remaining corneal opacity like this. So even we achieved the uh, uh, grading, great uh, grading score after the comet surgery. So of course the visual acuity was improved, greatly improved, but it was uh, 0 0.03 at this time. And then it was good, but it was not good enough to live a life. So uh, it's been reported that the scleral contact lens uh, uh, provides the uh, good uh, several therapeutic effect in the management of the SCS10 patient uh, due to the uh, masking of irregular astigmatism and the reduction of high order aberrations and then also the establishment of the precornea with reservoir underneath the contact lens uh, uh, like a uh, 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 prevention for the prevention of the uh, uh, cornea dehydration and then also the uh, evaporation of the tear fluid from the surface. So, however, uh, there are uh, several limitations of the standard scleral contact lens. Uh, firstly, the patient commonly complain of clarity vision and the lens fogging, which requires the lenses to be removed and then cleaned multiple times per day. And then second uh, uh, is that the square contact lens uh, seems to be a bit large for severely scarred eyes with conjunctival shortening because of their size, uh, the ranging from the 16 to 20, 23 meter. And then also that even in normal eyes, the orbital depth in Asian is relatively smaller than in Caucasians. So therefore there are new type of contact lens for Asian eyes uh, is needed. So uh, Professor Sototono uh, introduced and uh, developed a new type of contact lens, the limbal rigid contact lens, which is a bit smaller uh, uh, than the standard scleral contact lens and a bit larger uh, uh, than the regular rigid contact lens. So uh, the, uh, the size of the, this lens uh, ranges from the uh, 30 to 40 meter diameter. Uh, with an associated uh, of the optical zone ranging from the 8 to 9.5 millimeter, uh, which is designed to completely cover uh, the cornea and also the limbs. And then also it has a much step curve at the peripheral zone uh, that uh, can be can uh, uh, exchange the tear fluid. Uh, underneath the contact lens, underneath the contact lens, when the uh, lens are moving up and down. So, uh, uh, please look at the picture on the right. So, uh, since the scleral contact lens touch uh, scleral closely, there are the tear fluid underneath the contact lens uh, cannot be moved at all and the exchange at all. Uh, because of the tight having the tightly uh, attachment, so uh, while the uh, on the uh, limbal rigid contact lens, so since there are uh, uh, it has a uh, much step curve at the peripheral zone, it's easily moving up and down, and the tear fluid 
and uh, the contact lens uh, can be replaced easily. So, uh, and then also uh, the, the, the contact lens wear, this limbal rigid contact lens wear uh, can provide the uh, significant improvement of the patient visual acuity. So uh, in most cases. And then also I'd like to emphasize that the, uh, this study included the, uh, the patients with the visual acuity worse than the uh, 0.01 or sometimes uh, uh, the patient has a severe uh, uh, impaired visual acuity, like a con count finger or hand motion. But still, the, they uh, achieve the better uh, visual acuity after the limbal rigid contact lens wear, uh, meaning that the, even your visual acuity was uh, quite poor, uh, the, uh, the after the limbal rigid contact lens wear, you'll be able to uh, see the visual mo uh, more nicely. And then also the, this limbal rigid contact lens can provide the, not only the uh, improvement of visual acuity, but also the uh, decrease of the ocular pain and probably leading to the improvement of the social function and then even the uh, mental health, uh, uh, indicating that the uh, limbal rigid contact lens uh, can uh, give a uh, better quality of vision and the quality of life. So this is my last slide. In summary, the Comet surgery that successfully improved the visual acuity in bilaterally affected eyes in like a SGS 10 patient, and the limbal rigid contact lens uh, improve the visual acuity by one more level. And then also we think that the com Comet combined with the limbal rigid contact lens wearer is a reasonable way to reconstruct and maintain the ocular surface. So thank you for your kind of attention. Thank you, Dr. Itazawa, for your uh, very uh, clear presentation. Yeah, uh, congratulations once again for the separacy for Professor Tsukazono and team. Um, so I think we, we will move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, Dr. Sayaka Kamada will do the presentation. She will talk about the low vision care in patients with corneal disease. So I think the time is yours, Dr. Oda. Okay. Um, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sayaka Kamada. Today I will be presenting on low vision care for patients with corneal disease. This is the literature on the number of visually impaired people and the causes of visual impairment. Systematic review and meta-analysis estimated that in 2020, 295 million people globally had moderate or severe visual impairment and 43 million had blindness. The leading causes of blindness identified were cataract, glaucoma, undercorrected refractive error, age-related macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy in those 50 and older. This is about incidence and causes of visual impairment in Japan. The left graph shows the age of visually impaired persons who were newly certified as visually impaired on the basis of certification criteria. Most of visually impaired people were elderly or very elderly. The right graph shows the diseases that caused visual impairment. The most common causative disease was glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, and so on. And Corneal disease account for only 1.8% of all diseases. Thus, corneal disease in visual impairment are quite rare in Japan. However, in our hospital, we see so many patients with corneal diseases who have visual impairment because of a lot of patients with corneal diseases come to our hospital. Generally, 
The word low vision means vision loss which cannot be corrected and interferes with activities. And vision loss due to the following visual problems impacts their patient's ability to function. Acuity less than 2040. Scotoma. Visual field loss. Loss of contrast sensitivity. In our hospital, certified orthoptists and I are in charge of low vision clinic. We provide low vision care for visually impaired patients regardless of disease. Now, a low vision patients have very often photophobic, photophobia and glare. Visible light wavelengths are between 380 and 780 nanometer. The cause of mechanism of photophobia are still unknown precisely. One cause is the diffuse reflection of light due to opacity of the tissue, as in coronary opacities. Short wavelength light can also be another cause of photophobia and glare. In our experience, even if the corneal opacity is partial or in only one eye, it can affect a person's visual function. Light filtering lenses are often used to reduce photophobia and glare. For the patients with photophobia and glare, light filtering lenses are useful and frequently prescribed. They should filter short wavelength light, minimizing the loss of visual acuity and color discrimination. It is important to consider comfort, protection from ultraviolet, infrared, and visible light, increased contrast, and glare deduction. Different filters can be prescribed for different situations. When selecting the light filtering lenses for a patient with outdoor photophobia, we go outdoors with the patient to select the colors of flames. This is a simulation of vision before and after wearing the light filtering lenses. In low vision patients, sometimes the white haze is disturbing. When wearing light filtering lenses, the outlines of trees and branches become clearer, high contrast or sharp edges. Contrast is increased, making it easier to see the bumps in the ground. White haze is removed. Most of the market share of light filtering lenses in Japan is held by Tokai Kogaku's 26 colors and Hoya's 21 colors. In addition to traditional colors such as red, orange, and yellow, various colors such as green, brown, gray, pink, and purple are now available. Take a look at this graph. This is the effect graph of light filtering lenses. The horizontal axis shows the wavelengths and the vertical axis shows the optic transmittance. The graphs are different for each lens color. Many lenses cut short wavelengths light and differ in how much the other wavelengths they let through. Which color LED lens will help you see better depends on the patient. Because the wavelengths that cause photophobia and glare are different for each patient. Next, I will discuss low vision care for reading and writing difficulties. For those with low vision, near-sighted glasses or magnifying glasses are selected. Someone can read with high magnification and with a light. And these pictures are video magnifier systems consisting of a monitor and a camera that projects the enlarged image on the screen. It allows magnification of twice to 60 times 
it can be fixed or portable, allowing, allowing objects to be seen at various distances, and it makes the patients easy to read and write when reversed in black and white. The black and white reversal is very useful in patients with coronary diseases. Lighting control is important for people with low vision, especially those with coronary disease. A, a typoscope, caps or visors, side shields, and polarizing lenses should be prescribed to control the reflection of light. A typoscope is a black flame like this one. Viewing text, a black flame reduces glare. And the typoscope can also be used as a guide to reading, writing, and signature. I will show some useful goods to improve contrast. This is a rice bowl with the inside painted black. Since rice is white, it is difficult to see with a white rice bowl. Similarly, use a black cutting board when cutting white vegetables or fruit. Use a table mat in a different color from the tableware. The dishes are easy to find. When taking medicine, serve it on a black plate. There are many other techniques that can help low vision patients see better. I'm going to show some results of the examination in our hospital. Subjects are 102 patients with coronary diseases who received low vision care at the Department of Ophthalmology KPUM from 2012 to 2021. We examined retrospectively from medical records about age, best corrected visual acuity, disease, patients' needs, and the contents of low vision care. I will show you the results. This graph shows the age distribution of 102 low vision patients with coronary disease. The average age was 58 years old. 5 to 96 years old persons were included. This graph shows their best corrected visual acuity in the better eye. Visual acuity is measured with a laundered ring and converted to logmar. The average was 0.93. 11 patients had greater than 1.7 logmar. They would be classified as blindness. On the other hand, there were many patients with relatively good visual acuity. There were 21 patients with visual acuity less than 0.3 logmar. They had better than 2040. This graph shows the classification of patients with coronary diseases. The most common were corneal opacity. And next was ocular surface disorders, such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Of the 102 cases, 71 had corneal disease only, and 31 had other complications, such as glaucoma. Of the 102 examples, 51 were asked if color reversal would make the text easier to read. For example, black and white reversal or yellow and black reversal. The results shows that color reversal made reading text easier in 88% of the cases. Then, this is the needs of low vision patients with coronary disease. The needs were divided into five major categories. Of 102 cases, 60 patients had difficulty in reading and writing. 53 patients had photophobia. 17 patients need consultation on support for schooling and employment. Four patients had had severe difficulty in mobility, and three patients had difficulty in seeing objects in the distance. 
This is conclusions. In coronal disease, but polio and glare are common. Regardless of visual acuity, many cases of coronal disease require lighting control, light filtering lenses, and black and white reversal. Patients with coronal diseases also benefit from video magnifier system and the use of the tablet devices and smartphones. Some patients with best corrected visual acuity of greater than 1.7 logma could be classified as blindness, were able to read and write in black and white reversal conditions. I think we ophthalmologists have to listen patients' needs carefully and connect them appropriately to provision care. That's all for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kamada. Yes, a very important message that you mentioned about that we need to listen to our patient for uh, yeah, getting the appropriate low vision care. I do agree with you. So I think before we proceed for the uh, discussions, I, I, we will have a one presentation uh, from each uh, resident from each university. So the first resident uh, case presentation will be presented by Dr. Dewinta Ratno Kurnia Wardani. Uh, she is now a third stage of the resident. So this uh, she is on the um, third grade of the fourth year residence. And she will present about low vision management in uh, macular dystrophy. So Dr. Dewinta, the time is yours. Thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Yulia Liza. So good evening, professors, doctors, and also fellow residents. First, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Devinta, a third grade resident in the Department of Ophthalmology, Universitas Indonesia. And today I would like to present a case with the title of Low Vision Management in Macular Dystrophy. Uh, it's uh, uh, actually an uh, outpatient uh, uh, in uh, our hospital. So the patient is 10-year-old girl. It uh, her came to our clinic at April 12, 2022 with the chief complaint of blurry vision on both eyes since July 2021. And she was referred from other province hospital with eccentric fixation suspicious due to amblyopia of both eyes. And two years before the visit, she was still able to see the whiteboard and sit at the back of the class. And there's no his any history of red eye pain during eye movement ocular misalignment trauma, eye complaint, ocular surgery, and also history spectacles were denied. Uh, she had history of scissor one time at eight months old, and uh, she was born full term with a weight of 2.5 kilogram and no history of niche hospitalization or oxygen usage of the board, and also growth and development were good according to her age. Uh, based on the ophthalmolog uh, ophthalmological status on April 12, 2022, the positions of the eyeball is ex uh, exotropia 50 degree, and also the visual acuity of the right eye is 3 uh, uh, meters finger counting, and also it's uncorrected within hole with good IOP and also lens. Uh, but the fundus, uh, it found that the, there is a macular reflex decrease with a good uh, round papil and also distinct, with distinct border. And also, there's a dystrophic pattern around the macula. Uh, from the left eye, also the visual acuity, it's only one, mil, uh, one meter uh, finger county and also uncorrected with pinhole with good IOP and also lens. And the fundus is uh, same as the right eye. At first visit, the patient assessed as a suspicious cortical visual impairment with constant exotropia of the left eye. And uh, she planned to do the full-filled ERG and also VEP of the both eyes, home free and also brain CT scan with contrast. Here are the uh, ERG and VEP result from the electric retinogram and also the VEP, the conclusion in general, the cranial nerve 2 delivery is severely decreased. And also there's a slightly impaired retinal function with the con function are more prominently impaired on both eyes. Uh, here are the Humphrey examination with known as specific visual field defect and also the brain CT scan the patients brings from other hospital uh, is a brain CT scan with contrast for, uh, at August 11, 2022. Uh, the expertise has uh, shown no lesion or space uh, coping lesion intracranially and also no intracranial hemorrhage. 
then the patient assessed as suspicious cortical visual impairment with differential diagnosis as macular dystrophy and also constant exotropia of the left eye. And the, uh, the patient's plan again to do the fundus examination and also OCT macula for confirmation. Here are the fundus examinations of both eyes, and we can see here there's a patch atrophy at the macula in the both eyes. And it's still it's confirmed by the macular OCT. We can see there's a, uh, a severe thickening, uh, uh, severe, uh, th the thickness is severely decreased. And the patient is assessed as a low vision due to macular dystrophy of both eyes with constant exotropy of the left eye and also history of seizure. And the patient's plan to consult to low vision. At the low vision polyclinic, the patient was examined uh, for distance and also the near vision. From the distance vision, the best corrective visual acuity of the right eye is only achieved two, mil, uh, two meter finger counting. And uh, with the aid of telescope with uh, five times magnification, the BCVA can reach a six over 38. And also with the help of telescope with uh, eight times magnifications, it can uh, achieve six over 19. So for the BCVA of the left eye, uh, of the left eye is still a one meter finger counting. And for the near vision, uh, without eight, it's only achieved uh, and twenty uh, four, and with the help of magnifier, magnifier with the power is six diopter handheld magnifier, it can achieve uh, and eighteen and difficulty during usage, and it's uh, with eight, uh, eight times magnification, it can achieve uh, and six with the distance of twenty centimeter. Then the patient assessed as low vision due to macular dystrophy. Then the patient is plan uh, to use. Uh, telescope with magnification of five times and uh, two eight times as the vision aid for the distant vision and also the digital magnif uh, magnifier for the near vision and we educated the patients and also the parents related to the low vision community. So here are the uh, assessment, the final assessment uh, patients is uh, low vision due to macular dystrophy of both eyes with constant extropia still and plan the patient to do the contrast and color examination for further evaluation. Short discussion, by definition, low vision is defined as visual uh, vision loss that cannot be corrected by standard eyeglasses. And there are several uh, the definition and from Shaman and Whitaker, low fish, uh, is, they define as a low vision uh, condition caused by an eye disease uh, in which the visual acuity is 20 over 70 or poorer in the better seeing eye and cannot be corrected or improved with regular eyeglasses. And uh, here's uh, the table. Uh, there are changes uh, were, ratified, uh, were ratified for inclusion as revision in ICD-10 in October 20, 2006, in October, uh, in October. And it was recommended that the visual equity should be me uh, measured with both eyes open with presenting correction, if any. And also the cutoff level for divining uh, blindness uh, was, was retained. And the patients with visual equity of less than uh, 20 over 400 or, uh, or visual field of no more than 10 degrees in a radius around the central point of fixation in the better eye were placed under blindness category 3. And under this revision, the term of low vision was replaced by two categories, uh, one and two of the visual uh, impairment, and the category one referred to the presenting of visual impairment less than 20 over 70 until 20 uh, over uh, 200 in the better eye, and it's called moderate visual impairment. And also the category two revert to the presenting visual impairment less than 20 uh, over 200 until 20 over 400 in the better eye, and it's called severe uh, visual impairment. And this is current uh, internationally accepted definition of the blindness. And also the visual uh, impairment according to WHO ICD-11 in 2018, uh, the academies actually prefer, uh, academies, uh, prefer practice pattern guideline. Fis uh, vision rehabilitation for adults recommends uh, that patients with equity less than 20 over 40. And uh, there's uh, also contrast sensitivity loss and also pay for an or central field loss should be referred for uh, low vision evaluation. 
And for the evaluation in patients with low vision, we have to conduct uh, some examination and also history uh, is, uh, is uh, essential to do. And we have to ask about the ocular history, general history, and also the patient's objective report or, uh, of difficulties or goals. And also the assessment of visual function is must. Uh, we have to do the visual acuity, examination for the fixations, and then refraction, and contrast sensitivity, and also central and peripheral visual field. There are several interventions for low vision, uh, whereas uh, the low vision aids utilize angular magnification by increasing the relative size and relative distance of an object. So it's making them appear larger and also closer. And they are achieved through optical and non-optical devices. Here are several examples of optical uh, devices, for example, magnifying spectacles with higher ads uh, for moderate low vision, and then magnifiers in the pictures here, and also telescope, and also electronic device. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Dewinta, for a very uh, precise presentation. So it's really inter interesting case with the young patient. Uh, I think we need to move for the next uh, presentation that will be presented by the resident from the KPWM. Uh, Dr. Koichi Sakamoto will do the presentation. So the time is yours. Yes, we can see your slide. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm Koichi Sakamoto, resident at Kyoto Prefecture University of Medicine. Uh, I will begin my case presentation. The patient is a 64 years old man who was diagnosed with Stephen Johnson syndrome. His medical history is as follows. Uh, on October 24, uh, 2015, he visited Hospital A with symptoms of a cold and was prescribed uh, tranexamic acid and Mahu Fuji, uh, one of the uh, Kampo medi medication. On October 24th, uh, he developed oral ulcers all over his mouth, which were seen to be unable to eat within a, a half a day. He then visited Hospital B and was prescribed canal ointment and ensured it. On October 26, uh, his symptoms didn't improve, and he was sent to hospital C by ambulance due to a fever of 40 degrees, uh, redness and swelling all over his body. He was diagnosed with SJS and received steroid, uh, steroid pulse therapy. On December 21st, Although uh, his overall condition gradually improved, uh, he exhibited redness and swelling of uh, the conjunctiva, uh, coronal epithelial damage, limbar swelling, and pseudomembrane formation in both sides. Uh, he was then referred to, to our hospital. His medical history includes uh, hyperlysemia. Uh, he has been taking alpurinol since uh, 2015 and hypertension. He has been taking uh, serendipine and micarditis since 2015. And here are the findings uh, from his initial visit on December 21st, 2015. Uh, he exhibited redness and swelling of the conjunctiva, uh, coronal epithelial damage, limbar swelling, and pseudomembrane formation in both sides. His uh, visual activity was 0 0.7 in the right eye and 0 0.6 in the left eye. We started treatment with uh, betamethasone sodium phosphate eye drops, uh, cyclosporine, and prednisone. Here is his 
treatment cost. Uh, he visited us for the first time on December 21st, 2015. Uh, and we started him on cyclosporine, pyridonizolone, and betamethasone sodium phosphate eye drops, as well as SGL, uh, medalista fresh feet. A uh, DLST, uh, drug induced lymphocyte stimulation test, was performed uh, during his hospital to identify the suspect drug, and alpoinol was found to be positive. From January to July 2016, we gradually reduced his medication and discontinued his cyclosporine and uh, prednisone treatment. We observed improvements in epithelial defects and the calming of ocular surface inflammation. On July 9, uh, 2018, he began to use sun contact, contact, uh, sun contact Kyoto CS lens. We gradually observed the progression of posterior subcapsular sub cataracts in his right eye and performed surgery on September 24, uh, 2019. On no November 16, 2020, he complained of uh, photosensitivity in his right eye and uh, began visiting the low vision clinic where he started using light blocking uh, glasses and magnifying glasses. Here are his findings during his follow up visits. We observed an improvement in coronary vascularization and epithelial defects. The post-operative cause of his light, con cataract, uh, light cataract was good, and we detected posterior subcapsular opacification in his left eye. Uh, with the use of eye drops and the Kyoto CS contact lens, uh, his vision was relatively maintained, with visual acuity of 0 0.8 in his right eye and 0 0.5 in his left eye. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Hey, Dr. Sakamoto, thank you very much for your uh, very nice presentation. So we will move to the next uh, session for the panelist session. Uh, we would like to ask uh, the panelists from the University of Indonesia, uh, Dr. Tri Rahayu and Dr. Umar Mardianto, uh, to give comment on the presentation of the resident. Please, Dr. Umar and Dr. Tri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Julia. Is my voice clear enough? Yes, very clear. I'm sorry if there is uh, disturbance in, in, in the signal because uh, at my place there's a storm going by. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Regarding the case that uh, Dr. Dewinta is presenting, uh, uh, the case is uh, considered uh, successful for uh, rehabilitating the visual function of uh, the patient in terms of the visual acuity. But we still uh, not yet perform uh, the test for uh, color and contrast sensitivity. So uh, we must uh, uh, check thoroughly uh, for all the visual function that could be optimized in the patient patient so that the patient could perform uh, a task or could uh, blend in in the society uh, for uh, the rest of uh, their life. That's my uh, comment for Dr. Dewinta presentation, Dr. G. Um, maybe Dr. Tri has other comment. Thank Omar, you. But, uh, yes, Dr. Tri, mm. please. So uh, thank you, Dr. Yuli Aziza, Dr. Omar, and Dr. Dewinta already presented the uh, cases very well. Yeah. Uh, 
according to me is uh, I want to emphasize that for all of the ophthalmologists or maybe all of you uh, or the residents who will be next ophthalmologist, just don't forget and don't leave the patient with the last vision condition. So there is a lot of things that we can uh, give to them to increase the uh, vision performance and uh, so the uh, patient can have the um, can active uh, can do the daily life activity uh, better rather than if we we'll just let them with the low vision condition. That's my um, uh, maybe uh, just a brief uh, comment, Doctor Ji. And Dr. Umar and Dr. Tri, do you have any uh, comment for the resident presentation from the KPUM? Yeah, I think it is very interesting case of uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome. Uh, uh, the tricky part of uh, these cases is uh, even though the problem of surface is not uh, completely healed, uh, we see that there are efforts to optimize the vision with uh, giving a contact lens also and uh, uh, carefully choosing uh, medication that uh, uh, will help the healing and uh, still not injure uh, other immunity uh, condition of the patient. I think that's my comment. Okay, thank you, Dr. Omar. So, Dr. Tri, do you have any further uh, questions for the resident from the KPUM? Uh, thank you, Dr. G. I just um, curious and interested in the uh, giving the uh, tin tip our filter lens for enhancing the, the vision for who has a glare uh, disturbance from uh, the, the vision. So how we can, uh, how do we choose which one is uh, the best for a specific uh, condition? Maybe. maybe you have a uh, uh, more experience about the uh, chasing the the specific tinted glasses for specific uh, condition. Doctor Sayaka Kamada, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for question. Uh, so maybe uh, I will help. Yes, yeah. Doctor Three asked about how do you choose uh, uh, the correct lens, like the uh, the color uh, filter lens, uh -huh. and how to choose the proper uh, kind of lens for each yeah. patient. Do you have any suggestions for that? Okay, thank you, Ayuria. Uh, we, uh, we choose with the patient and try and error. In try and error. Yeah, yeah. Every yeah. time we try and error. Okay. okay. Is there any specific uh, filter lenses, maybe for cataract and for the um, cornea problem? Is there any? Yes, any diseases. Uh, mm -hmm. For any diseases, it's useful. Okay. But uh, we just try it, yeah? Which one yes. is suitable, which one is more comfortable for the patient, yeah? Dr. Sayaka, yeah? Yes, each patient. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's different for patients. Is it necessary for us to try uh, as the patient try it outside the uh, the room? Yes, or outside it, or uh, in, in indoor. So outdoor. Go indoor. for inside. If they need inside, we choose it inside. Also. Yes, it's very yeah. interesting. Yes, yeah, interesting. maybe it is specific for outdoor activity and indoor activity. There is any specific lens? Ah, uh, um, in the 
Japan, it's very common. Mm -hmm. But uh, Indonesia, um, I don't, I don't know on the same range you can use that that we use. Do you have any color lens in Indonesia? Just very limited, yeah, Dr. Umar. We only have uh, yellow uh, color uh, oh. glasses, lenses, yeah. So maybe uh, any lens, if you can choose any lens, uh, it's more see better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I saw uh, the spectrum of the filter lens at the KPUM, yeah, Dr. T.E., -E, well, uh, we are visit there uh, several, uh, several years ago. Oh, yeah, Dr. T.E., uh, try the, uh, maybe, yeah, see, yes, yeah. he saw the, yeah. the kind of filters when she visited the KPUM uh, several years ago. I think mm -hmm. the Dr. Kamada uh, introduced ah. her, yes. <laughs> Now maybe you, you can remember that yeah, the, the last time. Yes, we yes. Ah. Yeah, yeah. We can choose um, so, uh, 50, about 50 colors, but um, um, I wish you, can, you could use the lenses in Indonesia. Hopefully, Dr. Kamada. <laughs> So I think we will move to the comment from uh, Dr. Uh, from the KPWM. So Dr. Kamada or Dr. Tazawa, would you mind to give comment? Oh. I have one question to Dr. Devanta. Does the child attend a school for blind or low vision? Yes, doctor. Yes? Yes. Yes. What kind of work is available for a visually impaired person in Indonesia? Uh, work uh, job. Yeah. What job is uh, common in Indonesia for the visually impaired person? So what? Kind of occupations in Indonesia patients, uh, in uh, love patients, uh, that you mean maybe? Yeah, yeah. Love is so, yeah. Uh, yeah, for love patients, uh, for uh, the polyclinic, uh, so uh, in uh, uh, in Cipta Mangun Kusumo Hospital, the love patient polyclinic it has been developed from several months ago, and the uh, three the patients is varied, as from the baby, uh, actually it's not both baby, uh, but it's a toddler until adult, and most of them is actually in um a students of uh university uh students age is the most common patient from what I read from the um from the record, and also uh and also is uh, toddlers and also infants is also uh, many uh, at the uh, polyclinic. So because uh so because uh, they're still in uh, a very active uh very active um uh, person so they need an aid uh, for their visual functions. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, in Japan, people with visual impairments have long been employed in massage job. Mm. Massage uh. Yes. But uh, these jobs are decreasing in number today. Mm. So, uh, in the world, uh, in Indonesia, what job uh, do they available and are they available? I want to know. <laughs> yes, I think similar. Yeah. Dr. Umar, maybe you want to answer? Yes, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Julia. Yes, uh, traditionally, uh, it's uh, same as the Japan. So, those who have uh, Visual impair uh, tend to uh, have a massage uh, mm -hmm. for a professional, but uh, nowadays with the help of uh, uh, optical device and anatomical device, uh, some of them uh, are employed in uh, government 
government as a civil service uh, some uh, could uh, uh, teach uh, on gardening on uh, making handicraft or something like that mm-hmm. thank you very much thank you I, I also have a question that is related to Chris Dr. Kamada. So, well, I'm wondering, so when you see the patient with visual impairments, so what do you usually uh, do for this patient? Like you suggest the patient to go to, like, of course, you know, that your case is the 10 years old girl, right? So, well, so for kind of like in terms of going to school, so what do you usually tell them to do in the school life or in the later on? So she will be adult and she needs actually the, the job, right? To make a living life. So what do you usually suggest the patient to do or at this age? Yeah, thank you for the questions, doctor. So uh, because this patient is still in uh, 10 years old, so it's still truly considered as a child. Uh, at first, we have to educate the patient. And most of the most of the patients, the parents is actually the most worried uh, about the conditions of the of their ch- uh, children, of course. And first, we have to educate and also um, uh, uh, emphasize the parents that be, uh, even though the low vision conditions that the uh, the their uh, child have actually is not uh, making them uh, stop to achieve their dreams uh, and so so I learned from my consultant also from Dr. Umar I've seen uh, he was uh, examined a uh, uh, patients with a low vision and the parents is actually so worried uh, with uh, her children and uh, with the aid of um, like spectacles or uh, we can choose like magnifiers they still can read they still can learn something new so actually it's not uh, because of the uh, maybe uh, the limitations uh, he has it's not uh, actually stop the uh, their dreams uh, just so like that and also we have to also, uh, to educate uh, that uh, the uh, the the visual aid it must be used uh, and uh, if the patient is like now uh, stand, in my case is 10 years old girl uh, so we have to um, uh, ask, um, I mean, the, tell the parents that the uh, the children have to uh, sit in front of the class, and also the parents have to inform uh, their uh, their uh, teacher that the uh, uh, that the children having uh, difficulty on seeing. So maybe it's uh, several uh, educations that we have to uh, say to the parents also. Thank you. Yeah, and then also, the, is there anything that is supported by the government or country or the, the public? Is there any public support? Yes, actually, yeah. yeah. In in uh, in Jakarta itself, there's a public support. It uh, called Yayasan Layak here. Uh, that uh, from what I know, the Yayasan is actually the public services to uh, gather all the low vision uh, patients, and uh, they frequently giving uh, like uh, presentations uh, to uh, encourage the low vision patients. And also, uh, there's also another uh, public services in other. Uh, uh, province uh, and uh, that public services also giving like education uh, for working uh, to the low fo- uh, low vision patient. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, additional may, comment? May I add yes. something? Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in Indonesia, uh, sadly, that uh, not all of the equipment that uh, needed by the low vision, uh, low vision patient is supported by the government. So, uh, in our institution, we are working with the NGOs uh, that Dr. Dewinta already uh, said, uh, a couple of foundations that uh, will provide 
the uh, optical device and electrical device and they also uh, support in uh, making a group discussion or supporting group uh, so that those who are new in this condition will uh, benefit with discussion with uh, those who already been through this uh, condition and uh, how uh, they uh, those uh, visual impairment patient could uh, blend in in the society so if the can be restored uh, at the optimal level of uh, the function that they can achieve uh, and they uh, uh, we suggest that they start uh, inclusively uh, join the uh, educational system that is uh, uh, established by the government. So if they can uh, manage to uh, get along with that, that uh, we uh, always encourage the patient uh, to uh, blend in in the society because in the future, we, we hope that uh, the patient have the confidence to use all the uh, optical and non-optical devices uh, to perform uh, their every life duty so uh, they could uh, be uh, uh, choosing uh, a better professional professional uh, <coughs> life in the future. Thank you, Dr. Omar. So, um, yeah, I think well, it's almost the time. So I think we have to conclude the meeting. But I think, yeah, the great message that uh, so each patient, uh, we have to make sure that each of our patient will receive the maximum uh, tools that they can do to improve their vision because it's really um, uh, related to their um, quality of life. So it's really um, important for all the residents to uh, be in mind that uh, your patient is not only um, the uh, human, it's also a human. So I think we just need to treat the patient um, as uh, the whole um, human being. So I think the visual equity is really important. Uh, any other uh, comment from all the panelists here? Okay, so if no comment. Uh, yeah, oh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Last comment, <clears throat> Dr. Yulia. So with the advanced technology in the ophthalmology right now, we can prevent a patient from getting uh, the blind condition. But those patients will become a visual impaired person. So uh, we will facing uh, uh, increasing number of visual impaired patients uh, uh, Correlatively with the increasing technology of our diagnostic and our uh, therapeutic and surgery uh, uh, in ophthalmology, so uh, all of the residents should <coughs> uh, remember that uh, if you have treat uh, the disease, uh, the problem is not uh, over. You have to rehabilitate the patient after you treat the disease. Thank you, Dr. Julia. Yes, thank you, Dr. Omar. Yeah, it's really a um, very um, important message also that we can uh, develop from this meeting. Uh, yeah, because low vision is not a, maybe not a major um, uh, theme that usually um, discuss in all uh, meetings. So only small uh, part of the ophthalmology that usually talk about the low vision but i think it, uh, it yeah we we need to um, emphasize more to our community and also for the uh, the doctors also for the ophthalmologists um so uh, i think we need to conclude the meeting today uh, thank you very much for all your uh, kind of attention and i think dr farabi enjoying his stay at kpum thank you very much for having him there uh, we miss him so uh, please take care dr farabi um, so uh, the next meeting will be on may uh, i think we need to discuss uh, for um, the first uh, plan is for having the uh, lecture from indonesia but i think uh, we have uh, one more uh, suggestion so I uh, and, and we will send the suggestion through email from to professor sotozono uh, yes because we would like to invite uh, one speaker from the kpum from the radiology department, uh, Professor Tonzono. So maybe uh, I will send uh, the detail uh, later uh, because.
uh, one of the consultant in the radiology department is uh, uh, one uh, we is a friend from our neuro ophthalmologist here so i think we can expand uh, the discussion uh, more with the radiologist um, yes okay so i think that's all thank you very much for all your kind of attention and i think we need to take picture uh, please open your camera and uh, would you mind dr devin taking the picture Yes, uh, yes, doctor. So I will start from the first page. One, two, three. And then next. And then one, two, three. Okay, and next again. One, two, three. Okay. And that's all. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, see you on me. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Recording stopped.